So thank you very much for that introduction. Just a couple of things I want to add more. Um, so I have, I'm a proud father of three boys and a husband to my lovely wife. I've been with WordPress for at least 13 years with the current company that I work for with Urban Insight for about 12 years. And I enjoy homeschooling, gardening, woodworking, developing WordPress plugins, playing chess, tinkering and messing up electronics and eliminating any inefficiencies wherever I see them. So if you find me later on today or tomorrow and you want to talk about any of these topics or others, then please find me. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about a little, about, little bit about the terminology. What do we mean uh, by front-end architecture? What do we mean by enterprise performance? And then we're going to take a look at browser speed performance, front-end speed performance, and a little bit about front-end architecture. If we have time, we're going to go into a few case studies, and you can, then you can have all the questions you want. Um, so before I begin, how many of you are developers? All right. How many, have you, uh, how many of you have experience with decoupled architecture? Okay. And uh, how many are you interested in tips and tricks for browser performance and speed performance? Okay, got it. Thank you. So when we talk about traditional CMS and headless CMS, usually what we mean is that the back end and the front end is coupled within one framework, WordPress in this case, and WordPress is handling the data entry, but also everything that goes to the browser. So it's like a complete solution packaged into one. When, it, we, call, when we talk about headless CMS, what we talk about, there's a bank, back end CMS, and there's some JavaScript framework living on a different server somewhere that consumes the data through an API and then does its own thing, right? So both of them have their uh, pros and cons. Usually when we want to pick a decoupled solution is because we want to go with the front-end solutions, techniques, technologies, all the new fancy stuff to build the new fancy stuff uh, with the tools that are available for us and not get stuck in a monolithic um, solution but it has its own problems, so you have to weigh in project by project, which is the best case for you. So just about a little bit about enterprise grade performance is because most of you, or you'll have like a question, well, that's not, that's not the speediest solution, or this is more performant or speed. Well, we, when we talk about enterprise grade performance, it's not just speed, but we have to think about reliability, scalability, yes, speed and optimizations, very important, Security, compliance, support, and maintenance, especially if you're an agency, right? Integration, resource planning, performance testing, business continuity, cost and efficiency, and user experience. Wherever I put stars, uh, those are where WordPress shines in a decoupled solution. So, um, and I'll show you the, or I'll give you the slides later on. That's my opinion. That's the company I work for is uh, opinion, but um, you can disagree with that. So we will focus on page speed optimization, but we have to, at least in the back of our mind, think about scalability, reliability, and integration. Because as an agency, if you don't think about these, then you're gonna be plopping out websites, and they're gonna be coming back, and they're gonna be failing all the time. So whatever solution or technologies you pick, you always have to keep it these, at least these four things in mind when it comes to decoupled performance, especially page speed. So I'm going to start with performance comes from planning. And hopefully I, by the end, I'll be able to prove this, but I'm going to suffix this with a little bit of extra. I think performance comes with, has to come from planning because at minimum planning should result in using the right tool for the right job based on the project um, requirements, constraint, and objectives. So, and uh, we'll talk about more of that a bit later. So when we talk about decoupled um, architecture performance, then at least three things we have to talk about. First, so this is kind of a graph that I put together where we see the back end with its uh, workings, a front end JS server uh, with a front end JS um, framework setup, and then the browser. So sometimes you put the front end and the browser together, but just because we have to talk about the performance uh, differently, uh, I put it in separate boxes. So we have to talk about browser performance, what constitutes as browser performance, 
Then we have to talk about front-end performance and front-end architecture. And if we have time about a back-end performance or CMS performance optimizations, but you'll find out, or if you don't know already, it's actually better to just hide the whole damn thing and the front end and the browser should not even know about the CMS, should not even know about WordPress as much as we like it, because if you're thinking about scalability and reliability, you'll have to uh, pretty much use some of the big guys like Amazon, Google servers, and all that stuff to kind of shield the back end performance, but also the, for security reasons, to shield the back end from anyone who's using your website or your web app. Okay. So a little bit about browser for performance metrics. Um, let me show of hands uh, who's familiar with these. Okay, perfect. So uh, time to first bite. When you use a tool, and um, if you hit me up on Twitter, I'll, or if you go to my blog, there will be a blog post about using tools to, for measuring performance, but this is browser performance because Whatever you do on the back end or on the front end side, eventually what you do will hit the browser, right? And the client for, I guess, perceived performance, these are the things that matter for them. These are the things that Google uh, will measure on your website and that's how you get ranked in SEO when you know, your client will, these are the things that they will care about and which are first contentful paint shortly is when, so, Time to first bite, I grayed it out because usually the tools show you this, but this is not browser performance, it's everything that happens before the browser. It, they usually show it, but it's a sign of something else. So first content for paint is how quickly the content, like text or image, gets painted on the browser. Then we have largest content for paint, which is like the biggest image, the biggest headline, or whatever the biggest piece of content is on the page, when does that show up? Then we have total blocking time. It's basically while your JavaScript is running, it's actually taking up um, your CPU's uh, thread, and nothing else can be done by that time. Basically, uh, your CPU is blocked, unless you use something like a Party Town or something like other tools, but usually it blocks your browser, completely freezes it until the JavaScript runs. So they care a lot about this. This is a modern problem of uh, websites now is that total blocking time is huge because of a lot of JavaScript. So the next one is speed index, is just how quickly the content is visibly populated, then cumulative layout shift, which is basically as the browser gets populated with the big pieces, is anything else shifting, which is horrible user experience, so Google cares about it a lot. If you think about YouTube or some other web apps, uh, they try to have placeholder content of gray boxes here and there, so there's not a lot of layout shift. So that's another important one. Then time, time to interactive, um, which is like the fully interactive website, and something called first input delay, which is now becoming in 2024, it's gonna be interaction to next paint, which is sort of like, yes, you have the browser, here are the buttons, but you can't click them yet, or even if you click them, it cannot process that yet. So what is the time difference between you click something uh, and then it's actually doing something, right? It's very important for decoupled architecture. So how does this paint in the long picture, right? When a browser, when the website hits the browser, usually there's a for, first, um, uh, Time for first byte, which is okay. Uh, there's a handshake in there, and you got the first byte back from the server, right? So that's very important, but that's server performance. Then we have first contentful paint and largest contentful paint. In this case, it's exactly the same because the largest contentful paint is text. But if it would be an image, it would need some time to load that in, right? Then we have visual complete and then time to interactive. So whatever you're building on the front end, the, the whole reason for it is to use the tools to get this better, to make this shorter and the shorter and the faster you can get it, then it was worthwhile to do, to do decoupling. If not, there's no point in it. So it, this is just the bonus slide. Whether you're doing decoupled or non-decoupled on my blog, I sort of put together a checklist uh, of things to check if you are being dinged for first contentful paint or cumulative layout shift, 
what are things that you should check for? This is not specific for decoupled websites, it's just things that you have to think about. Okay, so when it comes to front-end performance, it, it really comes down to this. We want to achieve browser performance for set project with requirements. Well, because of set project and with, because of set requirements, we'll need to choose the right front-end architecture for that project. But the, because of the architecture, uh, the whole system will have different endpoints, inputs or not, and outputs. And then enterprising that performance means is how do you shield or how do you pad those inputs and outputs with bigger services, with Amazon stuff and Google stuff and whatever you can hire and you can pay for to make sure that um, your performance is not based on PHP, the limitations of PHP, or based on the limitations of big images or you know content delivery and everything else. So if you get this, these three things, you'll get a, and I would say, you know, if you architect it right, you'll have enterprise grade performance. Okay, so how do we choose the right front end architecture that uh, fits your project best? So there's a list of questions. Of course, this is not the complete list of questions. The first list of questions comes from a client, but then after you put your heads together, you'll have to ask these questions at minimum with your front-end team uh, or dev team um, what architecture to pick. So what browsers are you gonna be running that software in? Um, is it mob more of mobile or desktop? What are their bandwidth constraints very important? <laughs> Um, what happens if the back end, the CMS, the WordPress site goes down? What, what does the front end do, right? Um, how does it react? Then maintaining it, how quickly should um, a visual change in a, in a WordPress back end be reflected on the front end? Uh, sometimes that's immediate, sometimes you can just see the end, the whole thing, and you can, you can wait days, right? Unlikely, but sometimes that's the case. So based on that, plus compatibility. For instance, is this really an SPA that runs by itself or is this more of a widget that runs in other people's websites? So compatibility, how do you, how do you frame, or how do you architect that framework, right? Plus security stuff, usability, and so on and so forth. Eventually, you'll come down to one of these. It's either gonna be a single page application with client-side rendering. Think about uh, YouTube or um, any streaming platform. Uh, it's either going to be a resource-oriented client architecture or a Jamstack, which is static, in most, most, in most cases, a static asset generation, and we'll talk about this a bit later, or the client-side rendering with pre-rendering or universal rendering with server-side rendering with rehydration, basically a Next.js app. So the first one is usually in our case, when, in, when we work at Urban Insight, is usually the options are, is it an Angular app, a Vue app, or something like that? Then is it a Gatsby app where we push content, generate content, and serve it to Netlify and CDNs? So the first one is very interactive. The third one is very fast when it comes to perceived performance. And this is something that we're it's the last one is the universal rendering, server-side rendering with rehydration is Next.js. We're kind of, this is where we're going next, where it's kind of in between of these two different sides or different uh, ends of the spectrum, I should say. So let's talk about single page application and the architecture of single page application. So when we talk about single page application is what we, what we usually talk about is that there's your browser, the browser loads, the very first call is, one of the first calls is you get to load all the JavaScript that you're gonna use. And then that builds the app in the client's browser. And everything from there on in is gonna be API requests back and forth from the app that you built in the browser to the backend. And where WordPress comes in, of course, is it's gonna be your CMS where you're gonna store the data plus maybe API endpoints where the app 
to, with Angular that you built in the client's browser is going to be communicating back to the WordPress side and grabbing data from there. So that is you, what we call SPAs. Uh, you, you get the first assets first, and then there's a second line of communication afterwards. The issue with this is, though, when we come to browser perceived performance is that you get a really good uh, first contentful paint. Um, however, the time to interactive is a bit later because you get your first assets here, right? All the JavaScript all uh, gets in here. Yay, the metric, the tool thinks, okay, this is a really fast server, but your, your app did not do anything yet. Right, so uh, at that point, what you have to do is build the app, and while you're building the JavaScript, the browser is frozen, right? It cannot do anything else. So if you take a look at Twitch or one of these streaming platforms, what happens is it loads up, and then things happen, and then slowly things start popping in. So if you're looking for web app building or dashboards, it's very good, or if you have to do, um, serious computations in the client's browser, it's a very good option. But if you're looking for SEO or, um, you know, um, high scores for, for Google, it might not be the perfect option for you, but it's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is Jamstack with um, static site generation. So in this case, the just like how back in the old, old days, the browser didn't do anything, it just showed what the server put out, right? So in this case, the website gets built on the server side, it gets put together from what? From the content that's coming from WordPress, from template files, and it mashes them together, and it puts out, it generates an actual static HTML file for it, and then you, you can use CDNs or whatever to deliver it as fast as possible. And that way um, you get really high scores for performance, right? But there's a back, there's some negativities here as well. So in this case, what we usually use is Gatsby uh, with Netlify and WordPress as a backend. There's some other, of course, um, like Storyblock and some other CMSs that were specifically built for this architecture, which in some cases work better than Drupal and WordPress because they were built for this. However, um, we can have a discussion why we sometimes still choose WordPress and Drupal over um, other CMS uh, CMSs that were specifically built for this. So um, in this case, what happens, um, we Gatsby comes and grabs the content from WordPress um, and then it generates a static file. And then there's a whole architecture put together to serve the static file as, as fast as possible to the client. And then the client can still come back and communicate with other third party services or even your WordPress for, to do what? To do auth authentication, search, um, payment processing and all of the other stuff. Usually this is where the, only the content comes from WordPress, but everything else you have to use other um, third party services for. So it's really good because the FCP comes in really fast and then maybe you don't even have JavaScript or you have some little JavaScript for um, hiding, showing content, but there's not a lot of communication through JavaScript back to the original backend because everything is there uh, as you need it. The biggest limitations of this is that if the client makes, as in your client, makes an update on the WordPress side, change out, changes out the title or changes out the block, the whole thing has to run again. Like you have to grab that content, put it into the generator, generate static file from it, and then serve that static file. So it's not immediate, as in if they Change the content usually takes one to two minutes, depending on what type of um, generation you're doing, uh, to actually see the content live, right? If you can live with that then, and you care about SEO and 
uh, uh, speed optimization, then this might be the best um, architecture for you. But there's some other limitations here, like uh, there's limited support for complexity and dynamic content. But as long as you're like building a B2B website and you want it to be fast, and there's not a lot of like dashboardy stuff there going on, or there's not a lot of big content that you have to load in separately afterwards, then this is probably the best option for you. So for backend uh, performance, like we can talk about all of those things on the, on the left-hand side. However, they will all fail. I mean, everything will fail because of scalability, reliability, and business continuity if you have thousands of clients visiting your website per minute, right? So you can build the fastest WordPress website, you can build the fastest Drupal website, and you can serve content really fast. You're still not gonna be able to scale if you're like uh, serving a big museum and they do um, like an awesome once in a lifetime thing and you have to sell tickets, right? So all of that has to be shielded. So almost always for enterprise grade performance, you have to shield the backend. So all of these are still important, but not enough for enterprise grade performance. So you have to either do pure static site generation or offload the CMS, the CMS content either through, um, if it's API, then to an Amazon API manager or a Google server where actually your front end no longer talks with the back end anymore. It talks to these services specifically. So for, th for this particular reason, uh, I developed Fireboost.io, which is basically, it puts a layer in between your back end, which could be WordPress, um, and then it takes the WordPress API endpoints and mimics them in either Firebase for Google or mimics them on Amazon API Gateway, uh, where the front end is completely agnostic what the back end is. It could be WordPress, it could be Drupal, it could be anything else. In case of WordPress, it's just the plugin that you install, plus you have to have these paid services from Amazon or Google, but basically at that point, the API responses from WordPress gets cached and the front end only ever reads the cache. There's no communication, uh, like the straight line of communication between your back and your front end. There are like modern CMSs do it, but if we want a modern decoupled CMSs like Storyblock and others do it, but if we want to compete with WordPress against that for this reason, then we have to use uh, services like this. So am I convincing you that performance is coming from planning? Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take a look at a few case studies. How many minutes do I have? Probably a few more. Okay, so one website is Good Hire, which is a WordPress website with Gatsby. Here's the team who worked on it. Uh, ben was the project manager, Joe, Jay, and Jimmy were the developers. I wanna give credit where credit is due. So the structure is we use WordPress with advanced custom fields for structuring data. Who's familiar with advanced custom fields? Okay, uh, you could use anything. It's just the fastest way how we could put together, you know, um, Gutenberg blocks actually. So ACF, we use ACF to put together Gutenberg blocks, right? We use single sign-on and some other third-party services to do that. This website is hosted on Pantheon, the backend. The WordPress side is hosted on Pantheon. Uh, really good hosting, Josh, if you're here. Um, and then, <laughs> And then uh, we're using Gatsby on Netlify uh, as a single site, a static site generator. It then interprets the WordPress page content. It uses GraphQL, the plugin GraphQL for WordPress to consume the API of the WordPress website and use the data from the API. And what we did is we built the Gutenberg blocks that you build on, the, on your awesome backend when you log into WordPress, that is actually has a one-to-one -one Gatsby component to it. So we only, you, like, we let you use the Gatsby, uh, we let you use the ACF builder, but that's only to, to get the data into the database, right? Then that comes out through the API 
and then uh, we consume that through GraphQL and completely rebuild in uh, React all the components on the front end. Um, and then we also had to do custom plugin uh, that we had to um, develop for this is, yes, you can get the content, but other than content, there's many other things that you need to do as a website, like redirection uh, and like what happens with options. It's not just the content on the page. So uh, the um, Gat WP Gatsby plugin that we used, so when you save a page, it automatically triggers uh, a hook in Netlify and it, it, it regenerates the front end and it does everything that works if you actually update a page. But what happens if you update it just to redirect? Well, we need to uh, provide some custom plugins for that. Right, so a few tips here is that you may need to extend the GraphQL plugin, um, uh, like if you wanna provide JSON-LD data and some other stuff. Uh, so it's not always easy if you have complexities in the website. But if you're just thinking about content and generating static pages from the content, you can get away really fast with that, with all of those plugins that are there. Okay, so this is actually a startup that I started with Fabian. This is, any authors here? Anyone written any book? Everyone, okay. <laughs> Future, future. So I guess that would be exciting for you. What you do here, if you're selling your own book, is this is uh, an app where you put your ISBNs, and what we do, we generate a little widget for you, and go, on, go out on the web and find everywhere, you know, mostly, <laughs> where, your, where, your, where your book can be bought at, and then we put, it, we put that in a little widget for you, because, you know, not everyone likes Amazon. Right? Not everyone likes the other bookstores. Maybe you want to buy it from an indie bookstore and so on and so forth. So some authors really like that and this is a widget for them. And then of course you could just include that in your own website and everything goes from there. So the architecture here was the generator that you saw, or I call it generator. Basically this is a little Vue.js app made as a short code that we inserted into the B2B website, which is WordPress. So we are on the WordPress website, but then when you come to this page, there's this short code that builds this little Vue.js one page app inside of that page. And then everything that you do here gets stored back into WordPress through the WordPress API layer. Right. Uh, the issue is that, okay, well, like we know your ISBN, we know who you are, right? Uh, we can even actually go out and find the books for you. The schedule runs in WordPress actually. We use sometimes serverless functions to go out on the web and find the ISBNs on a huge list of books, uh, booksellers. But then what do we do with that? Because that widget that we generate, the one you see the next one, right? If I can move here. Oop. This can live on a website where we have no control over what's the traffic there. We wanna make sure that this widget always shows up. This content cannot come from WordPress. It has to come from a CDN. It has to come from Amazon S3 or something like that. So this is why we use Fireboost.io. Um, this is not yet released, but if you're interested in this plugin, then uh, you can find me on X or once it's released, you'll know about it, I hope, in December. But basically what that does is, uh, again, pushes all the WordPress API content off to Google Firebase in this case, or APIs, A Amazon API Gateway. So the embeddable widget that you get right now is an iframe, hopefully is a script later, is never communicating with the WordPress website. It's only communicating with the Amazon API Gateway. So that's more reliable, right? Okay, the third example is um, a wealth manager dashboard that we, the Urban Insight built um, with Angular. We have an NDA, I cannot talk who's the client and that sort of stuff, but the team was, Tom Moresco was the project manager and Joe, Chris, and Gerge was um, the developers. They did an awesome job here. So again, WordPress is used, 
because the B2B website is in WordPress. So they're, they're a little, you know, we sell this stuff, here are the pages. They want to be able to edit that really easily. That's in WordPress. But there's a lot of data there about the funds, right? So if you're a fund manager um, and you're using the dashboard, like why store that data again? Just go back to the WordPress website and grab it from there, right? So that's sort of like semi-static content. We still go back to the WordPress website and grab it from there. The, the dashboard, the Angular dashboard does that. And this is hosted on AWS Amplify. Uh, there's some, um, this is a very heavy app in the sense it consumes a lot of different APIs and the, sometimes the set of data that the app had to consume to generate the charts that it does is so big that we're actually having trouble uh, API, uh, Amazon API Gateway um, serving that data just because the JSON file was that huge, right? So because of that, we needed to um, set up some serverless functions where it's actually the serverless function grabbing that data through Amazon API Gateway and pushes it back to the, to the front end. Not a lot of roles here for WordPress, but still, if you shield it right well enough, it's a perfect tool and our clients love it. So where does performance come from? <laughs> Hopefully I got that answer. All right, um, any questions? I think you were first. Uh, question is, uh, so like the first example that you use, good hire. In terms of project scope, how many hours are we talking about? Is it like a couple of months, six months, year, how long does it take? So the question, I have to repeat the question. So the question was that in the first example for good hire where, where the, we used uh, static uh, site generation with Gatsby, what's the project scope in months, I guess. In that case, um, it was actually just four months or something like that because the data was there. They already had a WordPress website and all they wanted was page speed performance improvement, right? And then, I don't know if I should talk, then they messed it up again because of third-party JavaScript and analytic tools and all of that good stuff, and we have no control. Hey, if your team needs it, then it's gonna pack it on there anyway. Uh, but that was a very fast-moving project because the data was there, the backend was there, everything was there, and all we needed to do is cut WordPress head off and just build the Gatsby side of it to consume it. The problem was that that was an inherited project and we had, like there were some architectures there on the WordPress side that we have never seen before. They used sort of semi, like, well, I guess we shouldn't talk about <laughs> other agencies, but it was very hard to consume that content. If it would have been done just with, um, Gutenberg blocks, it's super easy to consume the content. But it was a mix of advanced custom fields, Gutenberg blocks, and the data was sort of messy from the get-go. So the time was actually lost, some time was lost to re-architect that, move data back into Gutenberg blocks, and then from with using um, GraphQL, suck the data out of that uh, structure and then provide it to uh, the Gatsby part. So that was a very fast moving project because everything was there. We had the designs, we have everything there. We just needed to chop it off and move it into Gatsby. I hope that answered the question. A follow-up question, for four months, give or take one or two developers or is it a team of four? Well, it was probably more than that. So three, the main developers, but there were QA people and other people involved as well. So, um, yes. I was wondering, are this? Yeah. Will it work for Flutter? Not sure if I'm familiar with it. Flutter is currently one of the views. It's, it's a platform that, that builds applications, deploys to websites as well as applications. Right. So, Fireboost is just something that shields your WordPress backend. So, if you are providing uh, API, endpoints to whatever, and you don't want that whatever to go back and actually reach 
your WordPress website, Fireboost shields that and pushes as it's quite dumb, to be honest. It doesn't know what it does. All it knows, it takes all of these endpoints of WordPress and caches them on a Firebase server or an Amazon. Right now, yes, we're, I'm gonna do a, another one for Drupal. So it's, it's a tool for work specifically for WordPress or Drupal right now. And what it does is takes the CMS's endpoints and replicates them one-to-one -one as is um, on a server somewhere else where you can do scalability, performance, security, and all that stuff at a mass scale. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, so we rely on... No, the question. Oh, okay. So the question was that if we have experience with containers... No, yeah. Um, we do, I don't. <laughs> so, but if you, pay, uh, uh, if you want that question answered, then I can get the right team to answer that from Urban Insight. Yeah, so there are, there are specific things in AWS that you have to do to increase performance or lower cost. And we have actually Gerge, if you want to reach out to him, he's the uh, director of infrastructure who would know more about that. Any other questions? Right, yeah, so the question was how would, multi, uh, how would Fireboost IO work with a multi-site uh, and hundreds of changes per minute and that sort of stuff. So Fireboost would be working, it's a plugin, it works as a plugin. So as long as, I haven't tested with multi-site, it's still not out, it's gonna be out in December. But basically what it does, it's a plugin that whatever you do in WordPress, it doesn't care about, you can, as you install, as you update content, if it's available on the WordPress API endpoint, it will know about it and it will push it up to the server. And um, it doesn't necessarily care about the, like how many times it updates because it just pushes that out. So it's, you might need a different level of service on Google or Amazon based on how many communication, but I don't think that's an issue. It's more of a consumption issue usually. Um, it doesn't care about it. It's just as soon as it finds an update hook and it finds the endpoints that were updated, it pushes that out to Fire uh, to Google uh, Firebase, and um, it's just there. The specific reason why we had to use it, and that that's when it got developed with that widget, was that we have gonna have hundreds and thousands of books, hopefully, right, for free, and um, we don't, we don't want to manage that data in WordPress or get that data from WordPress. The WordPress site individually can push that out to, uh, to Google Firebase as is, and as long as your, your JSON endpoint is okay on WordPress, it will just replicate it. There's, there's not really a big performance thing there. As soon as it hits, it knows about it and pushes up. You update, it pushes up. You update, it's very dumb in that sense. You don't have too many controls. If you want to do controls, you do that by managing your own WordPress API endpoints. It can deal with custom endpoints. It can deal with the endpoints that come with WordPress. It doesn't matter. If it's a custom endpoint, you have to let it know about that uh, when you set it up. But at that point, it just reads, oh, there's a change, I'm going to push it up. There's a change, I'm going to push it up. So it should be no problem. 
But to be honest, I haven't tested it with a multi-site yet. So that's probably in the future sometime. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, Neville, uh, Lehel is here today and tomorrow, so you can uh, ping him. If you buy him here, he can give you a lot more information. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you.